fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> WNBC. <laughs> Dude, we got a special show today. Mr. James McTeague. Director of V for Vendetta. Stuff. Ninja Assassin. Several Sense8 episodes. What are you working on now? The Messiah or Messiah? Matrix 4, uh, right? Didn't you say? Or- yeah, I did. I did Messiah. I, I did mm-hmm. that for Netflix. That uh, came out uh, last year. And so this past uh, almost two years, I guess, getting on to two years, I've been doing uh, Matrix 4. So I, I slid straight from Messiah and uh, Matrix 4. And, you know, we had a little, we got started. We had a little hiccup with the pandemic. But yeah, I was going to say, how's, how's the pandemic been affecting your Matrix 4 shoot? Um, we were just about to get going just as the pandemic hit. We were probably like two weeks. We uh, shot a bunch of stuff in San Francisco, you know, early in 2020, um, in the early months of 2020. And then uh, after we did the location stuff there, we were shifting to Berlin to do all the studio stuff. And uh, just as we were about to start the studio stuff, the pandemic hit. So we went down for about two months. Um, I came back to Los Angeles where I live. And then we got back up and going with a whole, you know, different set of protocols. We actually, I think because we were one of the first larger Hollywood films to get going, we, you know, we established a whole bunch of protocols on how to shoot and, we went off and did it, so we shot in the middle of the pandemic, which was kind of trailblazing as always on those matrix. Yeah, films. right. Huh? Yeah. There you go. Well, <laughs> you know, like talking about trailblazing, the last time uh, you know we uh, had to go around with the matrix, uh, it was nine eleven. Mm-hmm. So, so I, you know, you know it's, it's kind of you know circular. Every time you make a matrix, watch out for some you know worldwide <laughs> event. That's <laughs> right. That's Mister Smith in the real matrix trying to shut yeah. you guys down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely right. <laughs> Trying to blow in the lid. Yeah. But it's so, dark. of course, we're not even going to pump you for spoilers, any shit like that on the Matrix. We wouldn't be so rude. But uh, you're AD on it again, right? First AD? Uh, no, I'm not. I mean, I, you know, that's, you know, I haven't done that for a long time now. What are you, you doing know? on the Matrix exactly? Just uh, second uh, unit directing? Uh, what? No, we sort of co direct, me and. Oh, really? Uh, nice. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of Stuck nice. Up. that you know, like, you know, we've had a long history together. You know, we did all, I did the first Matrix as an AD, right. as you pointed right. out. And I did the second and third one as an AD. And then that was when I stopped ADing. So I stopped mm-hmm. ADing in about 2003, I guess. And ever since then, I've been directing. And, you know, this is the first one that she, that uh, Lana uh, has not has not done with her sister, Lily. So, yeah. you know, in the way that we sort of, uh, did Sense8 together where we sort of like, you know, co-direct and, you know, I, I guess, you know, in the way that the director's guild works that yeah. uh, you can't have uh, two people. Soul you know, credit. I'm not sure of the, yeah, I'm not sure of the, the same surname. So mm-hmm. I get a producer credit, you know, much like the way in the guys that the John Wick uh, franchise mm-hmm. did. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so th- that's what I've been doing. So it's been nice to, you know, this is, you know, doing this mm-hmm. movie is like, 23 years of my history uh yeah it's amazing <laughs> yeah, crazy it's a, yeah, self-reflective it's a, time and everything you know oh my god you know like some days you're there like going what you know like okay you, yeah, you just feel this um uh, this flow through everything that you've just ended up and you go wow how did i end up here doing the matrix again but you know circle yeah, because people fucking love the Matrix. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. There you go. Yeah, yeah. I had a, you know, but I had a, you know, like my experience of coming back was all great, right? Like, you know, me and Lana said, okay, you know, we're going to do it. Let, let's do it. But I had this very similar experience because as an AD, I worked on a Star Wars movie way yeah. back. When. You told us some good stories. Last time we saw you, we were having a beer too in LA because you were attached to direct our pilot for this tv show the revenger we had under option with the Mm -hmm. weinsteins and you told us a couple star wars stories i feel like you had told us something that you wouldn't probably tell on a podcast i can't remember exactly what it is but uh any star wars stories you got any matrix stories throw them into the mix oh oh, yeah well no it's just about to say you know my experience coming back to the matrix was good and you know like you know, me and Lana, I think we're like in a really good place about coming back. But I remember standing in the Tatooine uh, kind of village, you know, like the subterranean nice. village in Star Wars in Tunisia. 
with George, you know, we're wait, uh, George um, Lucas waiting for the sun to go down, right? Mm. And I stand there and he's looking around, he's looking around and, and I go, hey, how you feeling about being back here doing this? And he's like, I can't believe my life has come to this 25 years later. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and I'm like, you know. Sounded kind of melancholic there. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah Another one of these right? fucking things. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's that thing, you know, like as a, a director, you feel like you never want to get defined by one thing. And it's mm -hmm. almost like impossible to not be defined by, you know, if you make sort of an epochal film, you know, like, like a yeah. Star Wars or Apocalypse <laughs> yeah. Now or, you know, a Matrix, right? In some ways, people always define you by that movie you know like i'll mm -hmm. forever you know and luckily enough it's a like a good one i'll forever be defined by v for vendetta no matter it doesn't matter what i do mm -hmm. right I mean, that'll be the movie that uh, yeah we definitely want to touch on that bad boy for mm -hmm. a second yeah. at some point yeah. but uh you mentioned yeah. coppola in there and yeah. we're actually you know we do this my favorite movie thing on here and you're thrown out apocalypse now or at least Not a retrospective too. of coppola at least through the 70s um yeah. like you said that he kind of didn't allow himself to be defined yeah i don't Between know how the godfather off, but... and apocalypse now you know those are pretty divergent and they're moving into you know rumble and fish huge. and you know mm -hmm. he's always just kept it pretty pretty moving yeah. and diverse yeah i think like because that guy is you know he's got, he's got to be like one of the the bravest filmmakers out there right for yeah. sure you know, in a, yeah in a way he's kind of like He's like a post-war, you know, film director, you know, and I mean like 50s and 60s, you know, like right. you'd have like a guy like Billy Wilder, for example, who would do, had such a, an amazing career, you know, he did, you know, Double Indemnity, Some Like It Hot, you know, like all, all these very- Ace in the Hole. Oh, that yeah. Ace in the Hole, like all these really disparate movies that, you know, now people, once they find a, a genre that they like, they stick in. And I, and I think like, Coppola, you know, he he dared to go all over, right? Because as soon as he finished The Godfather, you know, he did The Conversation, which you go, well, yeah. yeah. kind of this small right. intimate movie. Then he does this sort of epic King Lyrian kind of Godfather part two, you know, what yes. does, you know, when the family's been wreaked havoc. Yeah, like an amazing movie. And then the next movie he does is Apocalypse Now. And you just go, oh, my God, wow, this is like <laughs> I know, man. Know, an incredible. Force. Yeah. Yeah, then, but I, I would say... Know, yeah, you say it's difficult nowadays probably because of the corporate side of it and the risk aversion and everything that they try and box you in as a creative so that they can continue to pump out yeah. bankable movies that feel less risky but remember i just watched hearts of darkness mm. he put up his own money for apocalypse now yeah, yeah I, know. I know he did yeah yeah so I, I, no one would ever do truly that. truly crazy yeah, truly. Ten million dollars plus. Like gave um, yeah. Martin Brando a one million dollar advance out of his, or he had to, you know, leverage against his assets and everything, and then he almost lost it because Zio Brando was like, "Yo, the schedule's slipping. I'm out. Fucking, I'm taking your million. <laughs> yes, man. Yeah, yeah. But cool. like, also like, kind of great. Like all those stories. You know, he turns up. He hasn't read the script. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Well, let, you know, well, let's talk about it." You know, let's let's talk about the movie. Like, what's the movie about? Right? He hadn't read the script or the reference material. Hearts of Darkness, <laughs> yeah, the Heart of Darkness. Yeah, yeah. and he gained all the weight and everything, which just casually showed up like, on set, like not. With, now yeah, it just so I happens to his expected. credit and to his luck, being Brando's, that Coppola scrapped the entire ending that Milius had written anyway. Mm -hmm. So when yeah. Brando arrived, there really was no ending. He was in the process of rewriting the shit in the jungle on the fly, yes. which yeah. is crazy. Yeah, I and mean, replacing the lead like he did, you know, so deep into the film, just it's insane. Yeah, no, you know, like obviously, you know, I um, got to work with Lawrence Fishburne too, right? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Also, you know, the, he was uh, also in Apocalypse Now. And, you know, when we were doing the second and third Matrix, they released that uh, Apocalypse Now redux or redo, yep. you know. Um, and so uh, Fishburne put on a a, scre uh, a screening. Uh, oh uh, shit! And, uh, yeah, and so uh, sat at the back and did sort of like a, you know, like a almost like an actor's commentary like throughout the movie. And oh, nice. you know, as as you were just uh, saying there, Chris, you know, he 
he uh, there's a boat where the uh, there's a shot sorry I'm, there's a shot where the PBR boat gets lifted um, out of the water you know um, at the delta of the river there in the movie and Fishburne yells out from the back that's the uh, that's the only shot in the movie Harvey Kite tells in <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, you think know, of the Redux version? I, I like the plantation scene that they had cut in the original. Everything I kind of dug it, but maybe because I was the acid familiar. trip with the bunnies, the yeah, USO chopper. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I kind I kind of liked it too, right? I mean, there's like yeah. a there's really like a lot of good uh, stuff uh, in that. It sort of makes it um, thematically a narrative uh, not as concise, and even though the other yeah. one was, <laughs> more like you know, an odyssey. Like, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, and. But still amazing, you know, like if, if they're the scenes that you left out of your original movie, right? Right. Mm. So, okay. All right. You're, you're not a bad film. You're not a bad film. Right. Right? <laughs> Seriously. If that's what's left on the cutting room floor, damn. Yeah, damn. Yeah. But, but also, you know, you were saying like Harvey Gattel two weeks out, you know, um, not to uh, bring the story back to myself, but here I go. I sacked the lead actor. Typical uh, James. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and like Fever Vendetta? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Who was two it? Weeks, two weeks in, I just got uh, an actor called James Purfoy. Yep. He's and, the guy from Rome who played Mark Anthony. Yeah. He's fucking awesome. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he's yeah. awesome. He's not so awesome with a mask on, though. He's yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Try it. That's a tough kind of acting, yeah. too, though, right? I'm sure, like, people don't appreciate how hard it is to probably not be too expressionistic uh-huh but at yeah. the same time convey something you know with that mask on it's tough yeah and that's you know like that's the sort of you know the the problem james had because he is a good actor and but like for taking away the thing that he'd learned you know his face same thing that he'd learned 20 years to use that he mm-hmm. couldn't utilize anymore right because then then it becomes you know really about your physicality mm-hmm. and he just, you know, he just couldn't get his head around it. And I remember, you know, when uh, I rang Hugo Weaving up, you know, who obviously I'd worked with on The Matrix and said, hey, look, you know, this is what we're doing, but I'd love you to come over and, you know, uh, be the character of V. But if you don't think you can act with the mask on, you know, like, don't bother. Right. And he said, look, you know, I uh, was uh, brought up on, on mask acting, you know, when he went to uh, drama school, now we mm. theater, right? all this other mask work greek theater and he said you know i'm i'm into it and he he came he came over and one of the first things i did was like you know really one of the most difficult emotional emotional scenes when evie uh gets let out of the natalie portman's character gets let out of the potemkin prison and she you know kind of realizes that that it's in v's lair you know v's um, Mm -hmm. place where he lives and she comes out and goes, oh, my God, it was you. It was you all this time. And at the moment, as soon as Hugo started acting, I'm like, oh, my God, I am totally saved. This guy just saved my back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you guys like, didn't rehearse. Do you, like, do you guys out. rehearse much? That's something I've always wondered. A lot of directors are heavy into rehearsal, but some do none. There's yeah. more choreography going on with those films. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, this is what happens, uh, you know, uh, um, as a director, you know, when you, you, when you're younger, there's a methodology that you, you're taught, however you like taught it or, or, or you know it. Right. Um, and I think you're very, you know, like some of those rules and strictures, you, you keep very much in line. And then I think as you get older, you start to let some of those things go because, you know, like if you, you know, if you rehearse and rehearse, it, it doesn't, uh, a, it doesn't really work out it it's different if you just need to block right so you know the right. dp and the sure. you know the grip logistical and, type stuff yeah yeah logistical type stuff but you know i i think that on uh sense you know the series uh, we did for netflix you know we traveled all over the world and sometimes it just wasn't practical to yeah. so we, mm-hmm. we sort of like block but then we just go, okay, just start shooting, you know, and that is also, I'd have to say, with the advent of digital, yeah. right? Yeah, you're not wasting the film. Time. The same thing yeah. occurred to me as yeah, you were saying yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, because you, know, and, and you it, have and, more freedom to. Yeah, you know, and, you don't, and you don't cut as much as a director, mm-hmm. right? You just go, mm-hmm. okay, go again, do another one. Yeah. You, know, you, yep. you, just keep, you just keep it going. And, you know, then the, as you start getting <laughs> free and around that stuff, 
you know, I know on the, the second season of Sensei, we really started getting free around the locations, right? We just go, you know, they'd show us, you know, photos and that of the locations. And then we just go to the AD. Well, why don't you go and check it out? And we promise we won't look where you park the trucks, right? You know, we sort of, <laughs> <laughs> right. sort of like that. Right. And so, yeah, I think you become a little freer. And, you know, I like to talk about Matrix 4 for a sec. You, I, we never rehearsed, to tell you the truth. We would just go, okay, you're going to be over there and you're going to be over there, but, you know, if, that, if that's not good, we'll just correct it on the next take. And, that, mm-hmm. and that's what you do. That is the beauty of digital, right? If, you know, you have to jump the first take, right, it's no big deal, right. even if you're mm-hmm. shooting something high speed, right? You know, because I remember, like, on the first Matrix uh, stuff, we'd shoot stuff at 150 frames, 300 frames, and there'd always be this tension, right, as you heard the film just start to go you know, mm, shit. And, <laughs> never considered like, that interesting like, you know, like, oh, you can you actually like, hear the cameras you know mm-hmm. and so now you know like you shouldn't did or you don't care right mm. you know, just go okay do it do another one at 300 frames who, who cares do another one at 150 and and i think it also you know like your workflow after as well once you get into editorial right it's a bit of more of a pain Definitely. It is right, you know, because they have to come through more material. Yeah, but you pretty much know what you want generally. You know what, and at least it's on a computer and not like actually cutting literal film. You know, (laughs) that makes it easier. Are you guys working off sport storyboards? Are you completely improvising just once you get to set? Uh, no. There, you know, I think a lot of you know it is in the prep, right? I mean, I think that that is a truism of of the film industry, right? So. Mm -hmm. You know, you take a, a, a movie that has scale, you know, like like The Matrix, and, you know, you have to um, do previews. And not and I don't mean, like, uh, computer-generated previews, but you're working out the aesthetic of the movie, right? So uh, on this movie, on Matrix 4, you know, we probably had about 15 artists, I guess, you know, mm-hmm. like concept the artists. Concept art, yeah. Board, yeah, concept art. That's fun. And so... Yeah, it's fun. And in the process of like working that out, as you're working that out, how does this look? What's that, you know, what's mm-hmm, that person mm-hmm. doing? Where are they situated? <clears throat> and then to actually work out some of that concept art, you do do storyboards, you know, just so you go, oh, right. So, you know, that needs to be there. And, mm-hmm. you know, this piece of machinery needs to be here. And that building, you know, would be great in that street. And so, in that early process of like doing the concept art, doing some, you know, storyboard work to work out the concept art, you start cementing, you know, all that narrative in your head and, and your aesthetic and, you know, the, your visualization of, you know, like what the film will be. So for, you know, for a good part of it, um, once you get to set and you shoot something, once you go back, to the concept art or the thumbnail storyboards you've done, they're pretty close because you just now have it in your yeah, head. Yeah, internalize it. Now, mm-hmm. Yeah, now having said that, the first, <laughs> the first, second, and third Matrix are completely different. You know, the, the whole of the first Matrix mm-hmm. was storyboarded because yeah. they couldn't get the, uh, you know, Lana and Lily back then. Uh, they couldn't get anyone to bankroll the movie. And the only way they eventually got to bankroll the movie is by making a graphic novel of the first movie, Mm -hmm. right? So you can hold up the storyboards from the first movie, like frame for frame, and they would shoot it frame for frame, right? You know, like they would like hold up their storyboards and, you know, then you'd lens up and that would be, you know, what we shot. And then in the second and third movie, there's like, storyboards again uh, you know and then there was this whole pre-visualization which was like for the battle of zion that was a whole computer generated mm. you know thing 15 minute segment that was kind of like that peter jackson shit for the hobbit yeah correct yeah. exactly correct and so you know in the way that you know the filmmakers you know have changed over the years so uh, you know uh, so has their style of you know making movies too so you know like now it's a you know it's a, a lot freer a lot looser this is a much different process and you know they're just different we're all i guess we're all different filmmakers it's 20 years since we did those yeah. movies. the only crazy thing about the digital too is while it gives you that freedom it also 
allows a David Fincher to do 78 takes of the same thing <laughs> right. or whatever. You know what yeah. I mean? Do you guys, because that it's runs like counter too with the rehearsal of it, that you're kind of sucking eventually yeah. the life out of the performance, you know, that you feel like the actors, I mean, even the truest pros probably only have so much mojo to put into so many takes, you know? Yeah. You, you know, this is what I would say about that. You know, there's the, it is no surprise to me that Fincher makes movies about serial killers, right? <laughs> <laughs> serial killers are about control. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> right. Sadism and control. Uh, no yeah. empathy for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. He says movies should leave scars. He, he might want his actors. <laughs> right. Yeah, but but uh, why, but why? Right. Like right. this is the thing. I think as you get a little older, way you know. Why does the process, and, and I understand it when you're younger, right? Because you sort of, mm -hmm. you know, that's maybe a bit of what your genetic makeup is then. And not to sound like everything gets better as you get older, because it doesn't, right? As your body starts to shut down, right? right? So, but, tell me about it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, like at some point, you just go, why, why does make, making a film have to be miserable? You know, mm -hmm. and, and it's in the. Yeah, some people seem to mistake effort or like the pain involved as being like of, of this high value where you could view it as more of the result is the most important thing, not like if it took this much extra effort or something, you know, like. Yeah. It's like they make art, their art of act of attrition or something. Yeah. yeah and i think like sometimes you end punishment. up with a miserable film right like you know like look at mank right did you guys see mank yeah, yeah we just reviewed it actually yeah yeah and i don't you know i don't i i don't know whether you guys loved it or didn't love it but no, you know, it, it kind of uh fell flat for us like it just we did a double really, feature of it yeah. in the trauma movie honor killing and of the two our favorite was trauma yeah. it's honor yeah. killing <laughs> right but yeah and i'm not surprised you know because mank's like a miserable movie right yeah. You know, I mean, and, <laughs> and it's n nothing to say anything about the filmmaking to tell you the truth. It's yeah, just, yeah. right. It's kind of like, you know, uh, you know, it's all, almost like, you know, Finch is daring, you know, now to go, hey, well, I'm at least as good as Orson Welles when he made Citizen Kane, right? He's kind of like, I can kind of inferring like that. that. I yeah. do give him props, and I did in that review of him getting this big Netflix deal. <laughs> And the first thing he makes out of the gate is just some shit he wants to make for himself. Yeah. Like good for you, you know? Yeah. Um, and th but, and that's, a, that's a, but as an experience, it might be just it, for yeah. himself, you know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that's a good position to get to too, right? Hell yeah. Certainly. It's the brass yeah. ring, man. Yeah. And he deserves it. It really is. Yeah. And you know, I don't want to, you know, slam David Fincher, but you know, like some of the actors love it, you know, we're working with an actor, you know, who did uh, mind Hunter and um, he loved the process. He's mm. like, yeah, okay. I'll, you know, like if, if you like to act, I'll do it all day long. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, me, for sure. if it'll be 50 right? days, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. But you know, I, I actually saw uh, a thing with Ben Affleck and Fincher and Ben Affleck, yeah, they were interviewing each other or uh, Affleck was interviewing Fincher mm. and he's like, yeah, that's really shit, David. I don't want to do 50 takes or 60 takes. It's like, you know. <laughs> so obviously Lazy. you get pulled out on. You know. It's got to be kind of demoralizing if you're like, yeah. if everything yeah. else is blocked, right, and everything's perfect, you're just saying right. the performance isn't right, right 60 fucking times. I yeah. mean, that's tough to take, man. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that is tough to take. Yeah. <laughs> Who was I yeah, just but, watching? Yeah. I don't think it was necessarily this uh, Heart of Darkness, but I was watching some director work in some kind of making up behind the scenes shit. And they were essentially saying they'd know what they wanted when they got it. Like they were shooting, not even knowing exactly what they wanted. And they would do all these takes over and over and over again, man, I wish I could remember who it was because I'm pretty sure it wasn't Coppola. It was some other thing I was watching, but the actor was like, what do you want from me, dude? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, it we'll was, know when we it get was Kubrick. Somebody was talking about Kubrick. Yeah, I was wondering if it was him. Yeah. Uh, uh, and he was just like, I'll know when I see it. Yeah. So that puts you in a fucked up place as an actor right. too, that you just got to keep doing stuff and throwing shit at the wall, essentially. And so at some point he sees whatever magical thing resonates with him and calls cut, yeah. but man, it's tough. Yeah. I, and I wouldn't be surprised if that, you know, that documentary or where you saw that wasn't for the shining, right? Like he, he's, uh, his daughter made it and he was, mm -hmm. you know, he was torturing Shelly Duval, Right. Right. Yeah, you know, I don't, you know, but you know, she was like, 
he had a run around outside in the snow and I, I kind of remember it going, I don't know what you want. And he's like, mm-hmm. well, you know, I'll tell you when I, when I have it. Right. And look, I'm, I, I mean, I think everyone has their process and there's no right or wrong. Right. And, and I think that, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, it, you know, like kind of gets you there. Right. And I don't know. And, and I know some people like also like chaos too. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. like, you know, I've been lucky enough to be an AD and be a director. Right. And, you know, when I, you know, when I was growing up being an AD, you know, I used to look at the first ADs before me and like some of those guys, you know, they just specialized in humiliation. Right. I mean, that's, that's, how, that's how they ran the set. Right? Very military style. Ooh, yeah. Very, yeah. Always someone they would pick on, you know, and in the same ways that directors would mm. as well. And I just sort of vowed to myself, if I ever got, you know, I said, no, if I ever become a first AD, I am not, that is not the way I am going to do it, right? I am going to make a generation, <laughs> I'm going to make a generational change right here. And, you know, I think that was the major difference, you know, like between me and, you know, whoever my mentor guys were, and I'm not saying that because I worked with some amazing ADs, but I was just like, all right, I'm going to change this. And I'm not, I'm going to be more, you know, I'm, I'm the assistant director. Mm-hmm. I'm not the assistant production uh, producer. Right. And so I'll do everything I can to facilitate, facilitate the director. Right. And I think in a way that's where, you know, I think in a way that's how me and the Wachowskis ended up, you know, working together and then forming a bond because like, you know, honestly, by the time that, you know, I met those guys, you know, I'd probably done somewhere between 15 and 20 movies as an assistant director, right? And this was their second movie, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, they're, 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 a, they're a quick study, right? Like they are, you know, filmmakers that are, <laughs> I don't know, you know, they're sort of like Mensa level filmmakers at some point, right? They just come in sort of, you know, knowing what they want. But I think that we, we had this great sort of, you know, the cross hybrid where I could facilitate the stuff that they didn't know because they hadn't done enough movies, like mm-hmm. you know, the makeup of, you know, how a film set runs. And, you know, that, those guys were, you know, were obviously on a path already, right? And the fact that they got, you know, 80 million bucks to right. the Matrix for their second movie is kind of crazy, normal, right? You know. But, um, and I, and, you know, like just to go back around, it, yeah, I think that a lot of those directors have passed now too, the directors who just yell and shout and, mm-hmm. and humiliate all day, right? Because, you know, now, especially now, it's not going to be. Except Joss Whedon, apparently. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. The last gasp, maybe, right? L'enfant, yeah. Yeah. L'enfant terrible, right? Yeah, but I remember you know, one. I think, I think there's like you know guys like that, like Scorsese and all those guys, right? I think a lot of them were they were real hotheads, and mm-hmm. you know, as long as your films made money, well, just made the money. idea of the passionate auteur back then, and you look at yeah. a lot of these amazing fucking movies we have, like Michael Mann's films and Oliver Stone's films, and you hear about them mm-hmm. being megalomaniacs, and yeah. you start to think. Megalomania might be a prerequisite or a required ingredient to make such amazing films, but I don't think that's the case. You know, I think it's just them getting away with it. I remember we were in Johnny Depp's office and he had a dartboard with Oliver Stone's face on it. And we're like, oh shit, did you get that made after uh, being on Platoon? Platoon. And his exec said, no, actually, Oliver Stone got those made and gave them out to all of the cast and crew at the end of filming, oh, yeah. <laughs> acknowledging that he had been a bit of a tyrant, you know, yeah. <laughs> madman. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's it's that thing, you know. It's, it's you, Sometimes you go, you know, because all those filmmakers you just mentioned make amazing films about the human condition, yes. right? They do. They have, like, this insight into, you know, how, how we are as humans, and then you go, well, how does that square away with you treating humans, you know, really? Well, that they're flawed humans as well, you know? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah it's like it. bullies who bully other people because of the, yeah, their experiences or what have you. And, I mean, you you know this, but you are just maybe more equipped, you know, personality type-wise, et cetera, to 
handle it gracefully, but the enormous pressure a filmmaker's under, mm. uh, a director specifically with all the money and the you know scheduling and everything's on your shoulders to deliver on time under budget, and the again the scope of some of those films they're making are truly epic and shit. And I could see some bad days on set. Like we all have bad days in our normal lives and cubicles yeah. and shit. So to be yeah. under that kind of pressure, you got to give some people some space and let them redeem themselves once shit is wrapped and everything but again like you said at least strive to treat everybody humanely and cool and shit you know mm -hmm. yeah you do and you're right you know like some days you know of course every day isn't perfect and of course right. it's you know external forces that you know maybe you know some days m make you not your best self right that's how i yeah. would say even but what you have for lunch might affect it. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but then, you know, there's the difference between that being like your modus operandi, right? Yes. To how you make, how you Yeah, make. yeah. But look, you know, like lots of those filmmakers in the 70s that we just, you know, touched on, right? Like they made amazing movies. They were given right. like amazing creative freedom to do. And they did really interesting stuff, right? Yes. But now you can feel the yoke you know the the yoke is a little bit like tight tighter now and you know unfortunately i think you know we've fallen into the trap a, a little bit right it's like the sort of bread and circuses thing right like do, do we all want more marvel movies right mm -hmm. know, do we i mean how many times can i see gotham be destroyed i'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not sure yeah. right how many it's more, more entertainment than art yeah yeah how many more times can i see the origin story of a, like a superhero mm -hmm. right, right. And, and and i know right like they they feed a, they feed into a, a lot you know a, a larger thematic of what's going on in our society especially like in the states right. at the moment right which is you know the empire is falling right the the you know the united states empire is falling and we need something to make us feel good like we can still save the world right mm -hmm. in the way that the western you know worked in post war america right i mean i think they're very specific american genres you know like those, those two things yeah like reclamation of the spirit the american spirit or something yeah yeah, yeah you know, a lot of it like uh the superhero thing you do see tinges too of sort of like the uh, cautionary tale the warning signs like you have um i don't know if you've seen the boys like homelander you know the the biggest villain is like the most patriotic like superman type character you know um and um the, the winter soldier, the Falcon and winter soldier, similar thing, you know, like the captain America is now sort of the bad guy, you know? Oh, right. So you see that sort of like, again, the spirit of the country kind of warring with itself on that front. So I see what you mean. Thematically, they do touch on those things a lot, but. Yeah, um, they do. And look, you know, I, 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 you know, more than anyone know that I'm not the demographic that, uh, you know, we're, I'm that we're trying to capture at the moment. Right. Know, like right. Films are, you know, very generically, you know, when you test a film, it's like, and once you push it out into the market, it's, you know, the, the quadrants are like males under 25, females under 25. Mm -hmm. and the then spending the money. Yeah, right. And then yeah. the, re the, the two other categories are 25 and up, right? Yeah. And so, and the main category is still like boys under 25, still like men under 25, because... Mm -hmm they're still the people who go back to the cinema again and again, on the yeah. same weekend on the same day who watch Which was it. us at that age yeah. too, you know? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. But we were into some crazy shit. Not Definitely. Fast and Furious right. movies necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. You know? but, uh, yeah. That's true. It might speak yeah. something more to the American school system and how we've sucked mm -hmm. art programs dry mm -hmm. and stuff. And the know? culture. So yeah. The viewers just aren't as sophisticated or into interesting, compelling shit. Like in the seventies, you know what I mean? And even yeah. just the counterculture of the time. You know, you're feeling the reverberations of the counterculture into the 60s. If you want to go back to Coppola and his yeah. movies, you know, yeah. I mean, look at the end, the way it's utilized, the door song, the end yeah. and the pocket is fucking fantastic. But, oh, yes. You know, yeah. if we were to be drawing from the previous generation's music, there's some mm. good stuff, but it ain't the end. The psychedelic aspect that infiltrated <laughs> the 70s stuff, you know, which even mm. something like the conversation the paranoia of it almost feels like how a drug can make you feel paranoid. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it's psychedelic without the psychedelic visuals. 
Yeah, and I, look, I, I think like coming, you know, like out, out of the 60s, if, uh, Coppola wasn't like exactly in it. He was like pushing at the, you know, he was really pushing right. at the edges of it, right? Like Milius, right? Like uh, <laughs> Milius is like, he just got more right wing as he got a little older, right? Yeah. And it, you can feel that like if uh, Coppola didn't have his uh, hands all over, um, all over Apocalypse Now would have been a very different movie. I don't know if you've ever read the Mealist script of uh, Apocalypse Now. It's on the internet. No, I haven't yeah. read but, Heart of Darkness, but not the script. The, yeah, yeah, and seeing the, the Hearts of Darkness documentary, though, the big issue Coppola had with the end is that it just became this big shoot 'em up, essentially. Yeah. You know, see, okay. Milius being somewhat right wing in his heart, even though yeah. he's progressed more that way over the yeah. years, that you look at war as valiant, valiant, and uh, the gallantry of it and the valiance of it and everything, and the honor like of Duvall's it. Like Duvall's character, yeah. Whereas a guy like Coppola is like, fuck war. War is hell. War is a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're not going to. Yeah. 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 That resonates with me a hell of a lot more for sure. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, you know, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, that, you know, the, the, the themes that that movie touches on, right? That, that, that just isn't, that doesn't get made, that movie anymore. Dude, right? mm, you, you can't that's like. A damn shame, too. Yeah, you, you know, like that. That mo- it's a it's a pity that a movie like that doesn't uh, uh, get made. I I do hold out hope, right? Because you know, if there's one thing about streaming TV is like this is the first time in a long time where they're taking a risk to make stuff, right? Because the censorship, like on TV, is you know uh, a lot looser, right? Like you know, with the MPAA, you know, like, with, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. I was just doing dubbing the other day, you know, like ADR loofing with the yeah. actors, right? You still can't like say shit and poo and we, oh and, you know, all these like ter- yeah, stupid, like cocksucker, whatever, whatever it is. Right. You can't say any of that in a movie. You, you have to like, when you, when that you is so actor, absurdly antiquated and <laughs> right. can't say fuck, you know, it's like, it's kind of ridiculous. You can but, blow people's heads off, but you can't say <laughs> cocksucker. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you you can't you can't you know show anyone having sex, but you can crush a baby's skull, right? Right, it's, right. it's it's so backwards. Yeah, it's basically Howard Stern's battle with the FCC, but mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, they're... but like you get um you know get on one of the streaming services and you can do pretty much whatever you want to do, and I think that if there's hope, it's like the generational hope of all those kids who are getting brought up on the streaming services, it, even though you know the streaming services there's a you know, there's a fair amount of Walmart, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're rich, right? Yeah. Like, there really is. And I know they're just like, you know, spinning a spinning a thing and hoping something hits now, right? But there is some good stuff. Some of the stuff that does hit is really great. And I think generationally, the people who are getting brought up on that stuff, hopefully, because, you know, people are a little more politically, you know, a little more politically awake at the moment that maybe there will be some good stuff coming out of that, right? There, there will be not just all this like cookie cutter stuff we've had for the past 10 yeah. years. You know? And hopefully, yeah, there is like a cyclical nature to it where people do get fatigued doing the same thing for too long and they do want to go back to some more risky artistic material. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of like the death of the Western, right? Why did that happen? Mm-hmm. Right? Because like, I'm here to tell you, you know, like, yeah, I, uh, you know, my main influence of watching uh, films is my dad, right? And he had an inexhaustible, you know, West knowledge of Westerns. I'm like, how do they make this many Westerns, right? So they turn them out. Bar, right? That's mm-hmm. what he's like, the B, you know, B film one. And um, I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit the same if you like junk, you know, what all the Marvel stuff is, all the DC stuff across film and across TV at the moment. It's just, there's yards and yards and yards of it. And at some point, mm-hmm. it gets, but I think you're absolutely yeah. right. you get sick of it. Yeah. Or at least, you know, like Chris said, with the boys, they're subverting it. But shit, I mean, V for yeah. Vendetta was subverting it back when mm-hmm. it was made because Alan Moore has always subverted the genre of comic right. books. Alan shit, Moore you know? is amazing. Yeah. yeah. How, how trippy was it to see the Guy Fox mask appearing with the anonymous stuff? Or is that yeah, them taking that as their, uh, <laughs> their uh, yeah. you know, iconic symbol? Yeah, like a, a amazing, right? You know, because when you, you guys know uh, when you make um, any piece of art, your your biggest hope is that somehow it'll slip into the cultural vernacular, mm. right? You know, and then 
you know, that to see the film, you know, like the, there was obviously the graphic novel and then there was right. the film. But, but you know, yeah, the film, film brought it to the forefront of the uh, public consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like the true sort of 20th century art form, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Filmmaking, right? And so people could now understand, you know, what that mask meant. Whereas if it was, you know, lots of people read comics and graphic novels, but you, there's no way that you get <clears throat> the audience. Right. You get going to see the cinema or going to see it on DVD or streaming mm-hmm. or whatever. And then, you know, a lot of the times, you know, uh, something you put in a movie gets, you know, misappropriated, right? It, right. It, it's totally off base. But I think for the most part, you know, people actually got it, like the Arab yeah. Spring, right? You yeah. know, the Scientology guys, the Occupy <laughs> Wall Street guys, Anonymous, right? They're all like, you know what? There is power. There is power in a mask. There is, you know, your eyes, we, right? Like everyone sort of understood that that is ultimately what the film was trying to say, you know, what the mask was, you know, uh, trying to say. And also that, you know, we were having a discussion you know, during those, and it's hard to remember back to the Bush years, the Bush administration, right? We sort of dared to have a discussion about what the morality of terrorism was, you know, like right. two, two years after we invaded yeah. Iraq, right, pretty much. And, and surveillance. Yeah, yeah, surveillance, or you know, all, all those things. And at the time, you know, you are just saying, you know, things are cyclical and circular. That, that was the same, you know, like in the way that Alan Moore and uh, David Lloyd wrote V for Vendetta on the back of Thatcherism, right? And all its, you know, repression of, you know, cultural values and, mm-hmm. you know, trying to re- repress society. Um, we sort of like took it and made an update to comment on the Bush administration yeah. or mm-hmm. other administrations or, you know, governments that had come before it. And then I think that it's it's lived on in that way, right? Like the Arab Spring was like definitely... Yeah. Com- and it era. got hijacked eventually, of course, unfortunately. But yeah, it I does. love that line. I love that line about Guy Fox, um, you know, going in to blow up Parliament. And the line is something like, um, "The only man to enter Parliament with honest intentions." <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, fucking <laughs> gangster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and but like the, you know, it's like amazing that the mask is out there, you know, but. I tried to get my hands on one just to kick this off with the mask on. Like, yeah. What's yeah. yeah. Too short yeah. notice. But yeah. 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 Well, and you can't control, you know, you can't control it too, right? That That's also a beauty in it, right? Because, I, I, you know, like I'm happy for it to be left or right or down the center, right? I mean, you mm-hmm. can't control. Once you push something out into the marketplace, you can't control it. But, yeah, pretty amazing to see it live on like that, I'd have to say. Yeah. Jay and I came out with a feature film recently. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, Cactus Jack. It's about this neo-Nazi guy in his mom's basement and Anonymous eventually catches or he catches their attention because he starts a podcast down there and he uh-huh. builds all these enemies and acolytes and stuff. And, and then really yeah, Anonymous, you know, <laughs> sends a message to him that we're coming after you, you know. <laughs> Oh, really? oh. We'll send you a copy if you want to check it out. Oh yeah, no, I, I, but I can get it online somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll okay. send you a link right now. It's yeah. a yeah. very seventies. Yeah. It's a movie yeah. that would not have been made. Talk about in risky. The 70s. <laughs> yeah. very, uh, trigger warning. But like yeah. Coppola, we made it. You know, well, I wouldn't say on our own money. We had some people pitch in, a couple of investors, but we made it for like twenty-five grand. So mm-hmm. it's oh, a. Wow. But yeah. it's funny. At the very end of Hearts of Darkness, Coppola, the last thing he says in that documentary. Is he's talking about the advent of the eight millimeter camera that he hopes kids and everybody will get a hold of. And yeah. it, and essentially what he's talking about is cell phones, what cell phones does for us yeah. now, that a whole generation of non-filmmakers or whatever will pick these things up and make films and then we'll truly have an art form again. Yeah, you know? it'll be more merit-based than access-based, you know? Yeah. If you yeah. democratize it, and it's hopefully the, the people who are really doing something interesting will come to the surface and not so much just the people who can, who are able to, to, you know, get access to that kind of right. technology. Well, and like our review of Mank versus but, honor killing, like yeah, more right. respect for the trauma film that had yes. no resources, but tried to tell the story, even in this janky ass manner that it did it, you yeah. know, with the bad acting and yeah, all the yeah. issues that come with that. It's almost more endearing as but a it's more endearing. Sometimes. It's kind yeah. of more impressive. It's more of a, you know, that's why people love that movie, American movie of, Wisconsin's own Mark Borchardt trying to make his film, you know, it's just like, 
There's something to be said for somebody trying to express themselves through this medium, but they're not a David Fincher, this technical wizard, you know? Yeah. Well, I, 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 you know, you bring up a salient point, right? Is like you can give a whole bunch of people like the hardware, right? But you have to be able to tell a story. I mean, uh, and that's ultimately what it, you know, comes right. down to. Right. And I, you know, I think Coppola's right. You know, he's kind of a visionary in that way, right? Absolutely. Like if you look at the next movie he made after Apocalypse Now, he made One from the Heart, right? Mm-hmm. That That's the first movie to utilize electronic cinema, right? And it was... He, he did it all wrong and I think he he feels like he got a little screwed right because he had this idea that he'd shoot it um, uh, like theater but he would have the sets in this lot you know in the lot wherever he was down in LA there somewhere I forget on rally studios lot and he'd have a street and he'd have the houses and you would move with the actors between the houses and into the street and you know inside and outside. Mm-hmm. And I think Vittorio Storaro, you know, as they got like three days before they went to shoot, he's like, I can't do it. I can't light all this. You know, I can't light it all. <laughs> look perfect. You know? Yeah. And yeah. so I, and I think it's sort of, you know, and then it became this sort of grand folly, but I, you know, you, you have to admire that guy. He takes right. chance after chance. Yeah. Chance, yeah. Right. I mean, that's something to really admire and, you know, and, and then, you know, so he, he has a failure, and what's the next thing he does? The next thing he does is like the outsiders and rumble yes. fish. Go, like, <laughs> great shit. Yeah. Which are great, and Love especially kind of interesting yeah. where the outsiders I, is so much more normatively made than yeah. rumble fish, which is pretty experimental actually in some yeah. of the shit it does, and beautiful, just a visual trip. But uh, yeah. even yeah. in the stuff like the outsiders, he is old school in that sense. One of the beautiful things I love about apocalypse now that gives it this feeling of this just treacherous odyssey and time passing and the humidity and heat of it and everything is the way he transitions using dissolves like who the fuck uses Uh, dissolves anymore (laughs) hardly anyone but for that languid pace down the river and this journey it's just the perfect way to artistically and he would do a lot of that shit even in brown stoker in camera Uh old school editing in camera like it was some dw griffith shit or something it's crazy He's a true yeah. artist, man. Yeah, and you know, like uh, you know, I worked with the you know Reeves with Keanu a bit. He, he, you know, he loved working on. Oh man, I bet. Yeah, Dracula, right? That movie's good. crazy, dude. It's got <laughs> some weird things about it, but man, he took a fucking swing, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, that was his sort of comeback, right? Because yeah, he's been like doing money for cash, right? Because I think he was like super broke and. You know, I think he did Jack, you know, like yeah. <laughs> or just stuff like that. But, uh, you know, like just to go back to Apocalypse Now, right? Like if you look at that movie and you string the vignettes like together that make up that movie and that journey down the river, it's just like one amazing sequence followed by an amazing set piece followed by an amazing sequence. Yeah, like, insanity. Yeah, you just go, wow. That, and, you know, that is like hard to do and you like know all those characters intimately even like you know duval who comes across like as kilgore right like he does like this amazing thing nearly with you know or with nearly all the characters where he he gives them all a very intimate personal scene before you realize what their larger you know position in the overall narrative is right Mm -hmm, so you get mm -hmm. kind of like set up the character a bit yeah 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 it's kind of nice you know like with the chief on the boat and Mr. Clean, the Fishburne character, and the crazy mm-hmm. <laughs> acid kid. What's his, uh, you know, like the yeah. Sam Bottoms, I think. The, yep, the Sam actor. Bottoms is the guy. I'm trying to remember the name yeah. of the character. Anyway, you know, like he's like taking acid and surfing off the totally. back of the boat. And, mm-hmm. You know, he makes it <laughs> all believable and, you know, like smooth. And that kind of voiceover narrative is, you know, it, it's, it's pretty compelling, I'd have mm-hmm. to say. That's, yeah. hard, that's hard to do, right? You know, like if you take a film like Blade Runner, right? Yeah, we just discussed that exact subject recently oh. too on the yeah. podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to voice me, it falls down to whether over. whether it's color or play by play, the yeah. voiceover. You know, if it's color, it's so much more immersive and, and it serves something. Whereas if it's play by play, it's not as interesting to me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a delicate thing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a, de- a delicate thing. You know, it's a total objective, subjective thing, right? That you always get mm-hmm. into a filmmaking, yeah. right? You know, like yeah. what, 
you know what you know what's your position as the filmmaker right like they you in it you're out of it you're observing it you're inside mm -hmm. it you know, all those you know decisions that you make how you know, literary it feels or you know immediate yeah. pretentious he talked about as well he uh -huh. said that's the worst thing for a filmmaker is you you want to be accomplishing these things and saying these things to your film but the last thing you want to be is pretentious yeah and he says and you make all these films and then eventually you're like fuck it i'm gonna just yeah. Do what I want to do, and if it comes out pretentious, fuck everybody. Yeah, right. So you know, with a film like that, you especially have to be careful. But yeah. Chris and I, we have this thing we discovered years ago. And mm. this apologies to our mom; she complains how much I cuss on this podcast. But we we're like, you can be as pretentious as you want to be, so long as you pepper it with some shits and fucks, like well. it's the Bukowski trick, you know? <laughs> All so, right. Uh, yeah. Apocalypse Now does that. It's pretentious, yeah. but it has enough shits and fucks in it for sure, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it has enough, you know, like yes, it has uh, has enough like character, like characters that just keep you going in the journey. Yes. It is like the Odyssey in a way, right? Like you're something very really, much, you know. And you know, by the time by the time you get to like Dennis Hopper up the river at the compound, yes. man, so yeah. you buy you buy. Woo! I mean, like if you had that in another movie, you go, come on, what, what, what? Yes. And, but it's you know, earned like, it it's earned it by that point yeah the, the we've all gone madness. mad by that point it's kind of like yeah. it needs it at that the point that expression dream, of madness yeah, and... yeah. I, I tell you i tell you what is like an amazing also in that movie which is an amazing um thing in films generally is the music right i mean yeah. that is mm -hmm. Like, some. like you said, the end, as Jay mentioned, and then of like Flight of the Valkyries and stuff, of course. Mm -hmm. And well, like the yeah, Matrix, a lot of films, iconic what moments. it did for techno music. I got friends right. who became techno fans from yeah. that that film, you know. Yeah, and it, you know, it, it is what you know, it is one of like the the true joys. Like we're in the middle of the music at the moment, but you know, the our composer is uh, Tom Tickfer. You know, the guy who, who the director who does you know run and all run and oh okay. yeah yeah totally and the you know and the international and all that's that. how you pronounce his name all right yeah, <laughs> yeah. and um you know like that you know run little run was also one of the first yeah. like you know to really utilize techno right like you guys were just saying propulsive yeah yeah mm -hmm. and you know and music is you know like as you know you guys know your filmmakers like you can feel like you go oh my god in this scene what, oh my god what, how did i what, i did everything wrong and then you put a piece of music to it you go oh my god i'm a genius I mean, I like that. <laughs> you know? and so you know like to do the music at the moment like with tom you know he just like hears things as a musician that i i i i'm like how do you hear that I, 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 you know i've made a lot of movies with a lot of music but he just has like this, he just go, oh my God. And he's always that is the cool collaborative aspect of film that if you are operating at a certain level, if you get to that level that you're at, you're working with amazing artists as collaborators, you know? Yeah. 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 He's, you know, like uh, uh, truly then this, you know, this score is like, it's, it'll, it's a, amazing. He has a, you know, like the, the process and uh, as a filmmaker and it's a truly liberating process is he, he, he records the orchestra and writes the music before you even shoot right like so crazy. Interesting. yeah 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 it does so wow. you never have, you never so have to can serve as inspiration for the actual creative side too i imagine if you already can have sort of a soundtrack to yeah you, you know, have a, like you have film to, against or write against yeah correct because you have themes right like you have them like going around in your head and then once you get into the editorial process right you never have to temp anything all you do is temp with the music that's been written for the movie yeah that's fun yeah oh, like, so, uh, like, fun. and there's so many happy accidents too like the dark side of the moon with the pink floor you know pink floyd and wizard of oz you know that you just can yeah. almost pair any piece of music up and you'll find these moments where it yeah. lines up perfectly yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember, you know, Lily Wachowski came in, uh, you know, we were making the second movie. She said, hey, someone told me to, you can pair up Wish You Were Here to The to the Matrix. And um, Oh, yeah? Did and, you try yeah. it? What's that? Did you guys try it? I didn't try it. I think she tried it. But, you know, I didn't try it. I'm like, wow, really? That sounds good. Cool. <laughs> well, I should have gone that. Uh, it seems like that album, you can pretty much pair anything. Well, like you said, just all the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Find synergistic happy accidents abound you know what i'm saying yes. yeah. yeah well if 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 something's popping with you know stuff right. happening throughout you know it's almost like guaranteed rhythms match up you know mm -hmm. yeah you know, know. yeah go, sorry. 
Well, I was just going to say, I don't know how much time we have left, but I was going to say um, there was one, and maybe we can do this in overtime if you want to stick around for a bit. But when we were hanging out in that bar after that pitch meeting, I do remember one of your stories was about the highway scene. And I think it was Matrix 2 or 3. I forget which one. Yeah, two, two, yeah. Yeah, where you had this moment, like this oh shit moment. D- yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. Do you, you want to tell that story for our audience? Tell that story. <laughs> I got another beer ready. I don't remember it exactly either. So I kind of want to hear it again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think it was like when we like did the, you know, like the 40 car pile up and, um, you know, we had, uh, we're, we're, I was on the back of the tracking vehicle and we had like uh, five cameras that were going to, you know, the agent jumps from one car and lands on the other and it like flies up into the air and, you know, all these cars like come crashing into it. And so I had this whole system, like if I got to this big exit Wabash Avenue exit, and all the cameras weren't rolling, I'd call like a bot, right? And so we were shooting all high speed and there's like, you know, people all over the back of the training vehicles and we start to roll and all the stunt guys are in there and there's all the pyrotechnic all loaded up in the cars to jack the cars up in the air and make them flip and fly and catch on fire and that. And then, you know, we, we're going down and one camera rolls and the other camera rolls and I'm looking up at the sign coming up and the third camera rolls and then one camera goes, not rolling. And then the other camera goes, not rolling. And then <laughs> I go, oh, and everything's oh, in oh, motion. Everyone, everyone aboard. And then, you know, I never forget, you know, like we come screaming to the halt and we'd been pulling the car, the car that was going to flip up into the air with this cable. And they snapped the cable between the tracking vehicle oh, and the, the car without the engine. And the cable starts whipping all over the place. <laughs> and everyone, be careful with that. Mm. Yeah. Everyone like comes to this stop and everyone's like good whenever we get all the car doors of you know all the cars come up and i remember about 40 stunt guys all walking down the freeway to me like they're totally like amped up they're like they're like what the fuck because <laughs> they're like hearts are pounding and adrenaline yeah, is oh going God, and then just kind yeah, of like they're all in fire suits and helmets this guy was just about to hit the pyro <laughs> button like, uh, yeah but, oh, then we, but then we went off and we did it and, you know, we did it. We crashed like 30 cars and then we didn't get something. We did it all over again the next day. Which Are you yeah. guys doing physical stunts and shit like that on this film or is it all CGI based? No, no, no. We've come full circle, right? Like we were the first people really like on the major. I, you know, I don't want to sound too grandiose here, but we were one of the first people, to, true, like, you know, like make, uh, make films in a green box, right? Right. Now, mm-hmm. all those Marvel movies, you know, to take an example, they make them all in a green box because I don't think mm-hmm. they can get all the actors together all at once, right? Yeah. So that, <laughs> right. But we've totally gone the other way. We're like, you know, we're like, okay, the, in this movie, in Matrix 4, I and mean, you can look at it on the internet, we got Keanu and Carrie Ann um, Moss, you know, Trinity and Neo, to jump off a 45 story building, right? For real, right? And so we're like, you know, because there's something in that physicality that you cannot yes. match. I'm here to tell you, you cannot match. Yeah. It's like on their faces. It's in like good to hear. Way, I agree. In the way they're flying, right? And those guys, <laughs> much of the Who was more guys, scared, Carrie Ann or Keanu? Who was more scared? Like, <laughs> they were both amazing. Talk about an adrenaline rush. The first morning we did it, when, uh, we did it at dawn. And yeah, we did it over successive days, right? The first uh, day she did it, when they reeled Carrie Ann back up, I'm like, all right, you jumped off as Carrie Ann and you <laughs> came back up as Trinity. She was like, the change in her face was like, <laughs> <laughs> like incredible. It was like so incredible. And, re- you know, they did it. They jumped off that building like 15 times. It was like amazing. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. What a fucking job they have. What a job you have. Especially yeah. when you're filming, like, say, that highway scene, you go back to as a kid, you're watching these humble westerns with your dad, and you're just like, it has to, your life has to be surreal so many times. I remember one other story you were on. telling was about being in a Black Hawk helicopter that just went vertical, like, super fast in the city <laughs> yeah, yeah. in like San Francisco yeah. or something. And you were just, they saw the ground just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they, those guys, you know, I was uh, shooting some reshoots on that terrible movie, The Invasion for Warner Brothers, for Joel Silver, actually, is who I did it for. Um, but um, yeah, they said, hey, you know, they're taking me on a survey over downtown LA and they said, hey, do you want this, the, the, the door off? And I'm mm-hmm. like, you know, I know I had done plenty of helicopter stuff at that point. 
And I'm like, yeah, yeah, take the door off, sure. Yeah. And so I'm like in this little jump seat. But, you know, usually you have like a piece of, you know, like plexiglass or something between you and the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the ground starts disappearing, and you know, like the you know, like the thump of those yes. black is crazy. And then, you know, I didn't want to go. Hey, can you put me down and you know, put the door back on? So we went all the way down, you know, from Burbank all the way over to downtown LA, flying amongst all the buildings down there. And I'm like there with the door off, right? I mean, I got so used to gonna die. <laughs> Alone, right? Yeah, yeah. Is it cool if I start filming now? No, when we get inside. Why are you here? I just thought it was really interesting, you know, that someone hasn't left their basement in six months, not even to use the bathroom. Is that true? Why would I want to go out there? I got everything I need right here. That's what's wrong with most people. They're weak-willed pussies and parasites. You buy into that whole, it takes a village bullshit. You know how many aliases I've used calling into radio shows? I've had it up to my goddamn gills with the systematic feminization of this country. I'm the only one yet. Did your old damn show if you think you got that much to say? Yeah. You live in your mom's basement. Fuck it down! Fuck you! What's so special about my loser son? You really do hate your own mother. She's a woman. Why wouldn't I? You know, there's some disconnect there, and, and if I could find it, what is hate? Where does it come from? Where does it go? You want to know what gender you are? Reach down to find your fucking pants and shoot fucking kite. Black lives matter. Do you call horses slaves? Liberal fucktard. Enough with the parades and the rainbow flags. Dude, this guy's, it's like pure hate, man. I want to see something really fucking cool. This guy is a fucking animal. He's got himself on a leash. He's itching to get off that fucking leash. And he's gonna fucking kill some people. What a fucking show. No, stop, man, stop! What are we here? Look at me! Look at me! We're gonna help you show him the light. We're gonna change the world. This is Cactus Jack coming to you live from a studio audience. To the man who calls himself Cactus Jack. We have watched as you have rocketed to infamy. And you wonder why these cornered animals lash out at the fucking side. And now, we have watched as you have called for literal blood. I know you're out there listening. It's buzzing in your ears, burrowing into your brain. Do it, Jack! You're gonna love this. I pulled that trigger on that motherfucker's head. Your VPN will not shield you. The dark net will not hide you. You and your kind are finished. You think I'm scared of you? Come and fucking get me! Might I be your neighbor? Neighbor? <laughs>